Hey everyone, this video series is going to be a quick review on dynamic programming. I'm going to go over two problems from past midterms, and hopefully in doing so, uh, you'll feel a bit more comfortable on the concepts. Before I begin, I wanted to make a quick word about subproblems. Subproblems are integral to DP solutions. However, they can seem a little intimidating, but I want to make it clear that they shouldn't be. A subproblem isn't anything special, you're not solving a different problem, you're not solving a new problem, you're not even solving a more complicated problem. All you're doing is you're solving the original problem on a smaller input size. For example, let's say that we wanted to solve a problem on an input size this long. Maybe this is too difficult for a multitude of reasons, maybe it's too computationally intensive, or maybe it's simply just too complicated. We saw before that in the divide and conquer approach, we could split this up into sections like this and solve on each of these sections individually. The problem is, while this works sometimes, sometimes combining our solutions from the independent parts can be extremely difficult and harder than the original problem itself. It's in cases like these when we want to try to, to turn to dynamic programming, and instead of making our subproblems independent, we want our subproblems to overlap. Overlapping subproblems is the key to dynamic programming. So in dynamic programming, our approach would be to instead make the subproblem something like this, like this, like this, and like this. Our hope is that solving the small subproblem of this size is easy, and then, since the second problem already includes the first problem in some way, we can use what we've already solved and do very few computations to easily figure out the next solution, and then use what we already did to build up to the next one. We can't use this sort of building up method if our subproblems don't overlap, which is why we try to do that in dynamic programming. The first problem that I'm going to go over is Successful Passage Through Grid World. It's from Spring 2018, Midterm 2. Essentially, the way this problem works is you're playing a game on a grid. You start at the bottom left, and you're trying to get to the top right. Every time, you can only move up and to the right, and every time you move out of a square, you either gain or lose tokens. If the number in the square is positive, then moving out of the square gets you that many number of tokens. For example, from the starting square, moving out of it would give me three tokens. From the square on top of it, moving, to, moving out of it would lose me four tokens because the number in that square is negative. Similarly, moving to the right would also lose me four tokens because the number is negative. The question is asking, how many tokens do I need to start with in order to buy my way through the maze? For example, if I didn't start with any tokens in this square, then I'd move out of it and then I would have three tokens because you get three tokens for moving out of the first box. However, now I wouldn't be able to move anywhere because moving out of this square loses me four tokens and I can never drop below zero tokens. Okay, so how are we gonna go about solving this problem? Thankfully, they tell us that we have to use dynamic programming, which means we have to figure out how to break this up into some sort of subproblems. Well, it's always important to know what the original problem that we're trying to solve. So if we're gonna say the original problem that we're trying to solve very explicitly, it's assuming that we start at the position zero, zero, we need to know how many tokens we need to complete the board. Okay, so knowing this and knowing our previous discussion about how our subproblems should overlap, I want you guys to think about, pause the video and think about what our subproblems should be. Remember, all subproblems are is solving the original problem on some smaller inputs that somehow overlap with each other. Okay, so hopefully you've thought about it for a bit. And the thing is, when you do more and more DP problems, you'll notice that a lot of patterns come up. One of these patterns is when you're working with grid pathfinding type problems, one of the most common ways to break up your subproblems is you solve the problem on coordinates i, j. In this case, what this would mean is this subproblem means how many tokens you need to complete the board starting from i comma j. And the reason why this is so powerful, especially in pathfinding problems, is because for sake of argument, let's say that i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 1. That means we're dealing with how many tokens we need in order to move on from this square that I have draw that I've circled right here. The thing is that every path that goes from this square to the end must travel through all of these squares. The square right here, the square right here, and ultimately this square. 
Presumably, as we're doing our DP solution, we will have already solved these problems. We'll already have figured out how many coins we need to start from this square right here. We'll have used how many coins to start from this square right here. And of course, how many we'll need at the end. This means that all the paths starting from this square right here will use paths that we've already solved the optimal value for, which is a really nice recurrence that we can use in the next part of the problem. So to reiterate, our subproblem is going to be how many tokens you need to complete the board starting from some i comma j. The next question is what are the base cases? So the base cases in DP are very similar to what the base cases are in recursion. A base case is a case of the problem where you don't have to do any more work to solve the problem. You don't need to rely on any other information. You don't have to rely on any further subproblems in order to solve the problem. In this case, the base case will be DP n comma n. This is because when you're at the final, when you're at the top right square, you don't have to actually, you don't have to pay any money to move out of the square and you've reached your final destination. Therefore, in order to complete the board, if you're starting at the ending position, we know that this should cost zero. Now, this is all you really need to say as your base cases, but something that I do to make DP easier is handling out of bounds as a base case. Let's say that we're at DP i comma j for some i not in the board and some j not in board. I like to say that this is equal to infinity. This is because let's say that we're in where we somehow get off the beaten path and we're, we end up in this position. The D DP i j should be how many tokens we need to complete the board from this position. However, since we're in a, in a legal position, we simply cannot complete the board from this position. Therefore, I like to set it equal to infinity to symbolize that it's impossible from this position, or that we're out of bounds. So how can we write the recurrence relation for the subproblems? Writing recurrence relations for subproblems is very similar to taking the recursive leap of faith that you might have taken in CS61A. Basically, what you want to do is if you're trying to solve the subproblem i, j, you want to assume that you have already have the answer to every single subproblem that's smaller than that. For example, in this case, if we want to solve dp i comma j, we want to assume that we've already solved i plus 1 comma j, i, j plus 1, i plus 1, j plus 1, and everything smaller than that. So knowing that, we've ha knowing that we have the correct answer to everything, um, to every subproblem smaller than the current one, how can we express the current subproblem in terms of all the smaller ones? Well, in this case, let's see. Assuming that we're starting at the square i comma j, we know that it costs us three tokens to move out of i comma j. Let's say that we've already solved i plus one comma j, dp i plus one comma j, and we know that it takes minimum eight tokens to go from i plus one comma j to the end. Similarly, since we've solved every single subproblem smaller, we've already solved i comma j plus one to know that it takes at, mo at minimum seven tokens to go from this one to the end. This means that if we choose to go right, then we will need a total of 10 coins because we'll have to pay three tokens to go to i comma j plus one. And from there, we'll have the second seven tokens necessary to finish the board. Similarly, if we choose to go up, then we will need a total of 11 tokens because we'll have to pay three tokens to get out and the eight tokens that we've already solved for needed to get to the end. So what does this mean? Our relationship, and remember, we're trying to minimize the number of tokens that we use. We want to go up if the number of tokens needed for the up square is less, or to the right, if the number of tokens needed for the right square is less. In this particular case, it would seem that going to the right is better, because it requires 7 tokens over 8. So, I think from here, you should be able to see that the relationship should look something like this. There is one thing, however, that this solution is missing. Assume that instead of this being a negative number, this is a positive number. For example, let's say that, sorry, one second. Let's say that this number right here is four instead of three. Now, our formula appears to work because since we need a total of eight tokens, since we need a total of seven tokens if we're going to go to this square, then since we know that we're gonna get 
th we need seven tokens if we're starting from this square. And so we, since we know that we're going to get four from leaving the square, we only really need three. We, need, we only need three tokens from this square to finish the puzzle. However, instead of four, let's say that we get something like 11 tokens from leaving the square. It can be pretty easy to say that if we followed our formula, then we'll need negative four tokens at this square in order to progress. This is because if we have quote unquote negative four tokens at this square and we move one to the right, then we'll have seven tokens because we'll have gotten 11 from moving out and that'll be enough to finish the maze. However, remember that in the problem, it says we can never dip below zero coins. So it doesn't really make sense for us to start with a negative number of tokens. So this means what we have to do is to ensure that we never drop below zero tokens, we should take the max of whatever this result is and zero. And this is our recurrence relation. So what is the time complexity of this algorithm in big theta notation? Well, as you can probably tell, we're basically filling out dp i comma j, where the table that we're using is the size of the grid. So the size of the grid is n by n, so we have an O of n squared table. And again, it takes a constant amount of time in order to fill out every entry in the table. Because remember, if in our recurrence relation, we're only comparing the minimum of two results. Therefore, we can say that since it takes a constant amount of time to fill out every entry in the table, we can say that it'll take O of n squared time to fill it out. Space complexity is a little bit more complicated. Say that we're at this position right here. Do we care at all about this value right here? No, we don't care about this value right here. In fact, all we care about in order to fill out this position are these two values. So clearly, we don't need to store the entire table to be as efficient as possible. So the space complexity cannot be, or the space complexity in the ideal case should be less than O of n squared. However, it's tempting to say that the space complexity is constant. This is because we only need two things in order to compute a single value. In order to compute this value right here, we only need two other squares. However, the thing about this is if once we compute this value, then we only have one value. And with only one value, we're not able to compute any other um, squares. So we stop. So we know that the space complexity must be greater than or equal to O of 1. So if I was on a test, I would, it's, it's a, it would be a safe guess here to guess O of n, because we know it has to be greater than constant, and we know it has to be less than n squared. Basically, what we want to think about now is what is the most efficient way for us to fill out the table such that we have to keep track of as little information as possible while still being able to solve the problem. It turns out that if we fill out the table in this way, along the row like this, and then once we, and we store and we basically store only n things at a time, we can get away with O of n space complexity. I want you guys to think about how exactly you would fill out the table in the most efficient way to get O of n space complexity. There is the solution in the posted online. However, I think you guys should be able to solve this problem.